when we do brain imaging, we're we're measuring the artifacts of the algorithm. We're measuring like the intermediate stages that the algorithm that the algorithm sort of outputs in order to do its next step, right? Like we can see the states that are happening, but we don't have trouble seeing the actual operations. And I think if we could do that well in humans, we would have some sense of what people what people's algorithm are it is. There is an infinite number of algorithms that we can come up with. I think that we should think in terms of learning principles and just develop as many algorithms as needed until we have something that captures a lot. I don't think like reinforcement learning or even learning in general is necessarily what our brains were built to do or is <sighs> like all that they do. Um, I, and I think learning itself is a continuous concept. We should take a, a more broad approach than just to say, you know, oh, we, we need to understand learning only in terms of the kinds of algorithms that can encompass learning. This is Brain Inspired. Is a riverbed alive? That's one of the questions that we tackle here in this last panel discussion in the Neuromatch Deep Learning series. So this week in Neuromatch, it was all about advanced methods, unsupervised and self-supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and continual learning slash causality. We don't talk about causality at all, and uh, we we actually have a pretty uh, broad uh, meandering discussion. So with me today is Alana Fish from the University of Alberta. Jane Wong from DeepMind, who's been on the show before, and Ida Momenajad, who's now at Microsoft, who's also been on the podcast before. Some of what we do talk about uh, is uh, language and representations, what separates humans from the rest of the animal kingdom and bacteria and rocks and rivers and AI. We talk a little bit about meta-learning and continual learning more broadly, what meaning is, and lots of other things. Like I said, it was a uh, broad discussion. So you can go to the show notes to learn more about the panelists at braininspired.co slash podcast slash NMA dash six. For those of you in Neuromatch, I hope you enjoy your experiences in Neuromatch. And actually, just as I'm recording this, which is right after we had the discussion, Ida emailed me and asked if I could add, if it's not too late, that she thinks the internet as a whole is closer to life than a riverbed is, exclamation point. There's a little nugget to put in your pocket for later uh, in the discussion, but I'm done recording the intro, so I can't wait for Jane to respond via email. This was a fun conversation to round out these panel discussions. Enjoy. Alana, before uh, you introduce yourself, I have to ask you a question. So you worked uh, at Google in Pittsburgh, correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, While you were working there, did you ever do any of the in-house yoga uh, classes that were offered? I know you guys probably had a lot of offered ping pong and stuff like that. Let me think. So I was in their, well, what was technically their second office on CMU campus. Yeah. my So my wife taught yoga at um, at all of their Pittsburgh campuses. And, and I thought, oh, I wonder, because you were uh, you were working there around the same time I was in graduate school and she was oh, funny. T- teaching oh, that's yoga. So, funny. so I was wondering yeah. if, if uh, she had taught you I yoga. I feel like, yes, but... God, it was a long time ago. I was there like 2007 to 2009. So yeah, I believe she was. T- I'll, I'll have to ask her, but it was. It's funny because she taught yoga all around, and at at Google specifically, a bunch of engineers. She she said uh, that it was so funny because uh, you guys, I'm going to say, were so like compliant uh, that she, at one point she was just she got a foot cramp and she started like moving her foot around, and and then everyone in the room started moving their foot around as if that was the yoga move. That's engineers. <laughs> Very good <laughs> yeah. at instruction following. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. It was a good time for her. So, uh, hi, Alana. So, um, Ida and Jane have both been on the uh, podcast before. You have not, so welcome. And uh, why don't you, who the heck are you? What do you do? Uh, I'm Alana Fish. I'm a professor at the University of Alberta. I'm also a fellow at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Uh, and in my work, I like to think that we um, compare representations. So, we look at how computer models represent the world, including using vision and language. We look at the internal representations and we compare those to human representations in the brain and ask how, um, using brain imaging, and we ask how those representations are similar, how they're different, and how they change. 
So I want to go around uh, right after you guys introduced yourselves also, and I'd love for you to say what you think might have been your your first really good question that uh, you asked um, at any point in your career or pre-career, who knows? Uh, and then I'd like you to uh, uh, talk about maybe something that is, that, that's a question right now that you feel like is, is just beyond your grasp. Uh, good. Okay. So I have a young son. He's two and a half. So I have to say that we all ask excellent questions as we're young, as youngins. And one of the really good ones is why? <laughs> oh, <laughs> just like over and over again, why? Um, but in grad school, I had this idea that um, that maybe language models and uh, the brain were actually representing the same thing and we could improve computer models of language using brain imaging data. And so in 2014, I published a paper showing that that actually did work. And I've actually, yeah, recently expanded upon it again. So that's sort of what I would say was my big uh, aha moment that it's actually all the same brains, computer models, all the same thing, because it's all living, sort of living in the same world. Hmm. Um, something that's just outside of my grasp. So I like, I would like to take that idea a little bit further so we can measure how people do things using brain imaging data. And so I would like to, to use that idea to improve uh, computer models of language in the areas that they are just failing right now, like common sense reasoning, um, sort of implications and inference and dialogue. All these things are just natural to us. We do them all the time without even thinking. Computer models just fall apart. And I, I feel like is like, where is that link between what, what people are doing with their brains and what computer models are not doing? How can we, how can we find that connection? Mm. But we'll come back to the question of meaning in a little bit as well, uh, which is related. Very good. Jane, you want to uh, go next? And who are you? What do you do? And uh, what was an early, well, maybe an early good question, maybe your first good question? And then what, what do you not know right now that you wish you knew? Okay. Hi, I'm Jane Wong. I'm a research scientist at DeepMind on the neuroscience team. Uh, and I've been working there about six years now. I uh, can't believe it's been six years. Um, <laughs> and I was a neuroscientist slash, I guess, kind of physicist before that. Uh, I actually did my PhD in applied physics, uh, where I applied um, the uh, applied physics, I guess, to computational <laughs> neuroscience and uh, was essentially creating these uh, dynamic systems uh, or you know, modeling systems of the brain in a very abstract sense, not in a, um, uh, any kind of biologically detailed way necessarily. Um, and then in my postdoc, I, uh, I entered more into the cognitive neuroscience realm of dealing with actual, um, you know, real brain systems and, and humans and doing neuroimaging and, um, you know, cognitive modeling and all that stuff. Let me, can I just, I'm going to jump in and interrupt you. So if you had to do it again, would you switch the order of anything, or was that a was that a good order? I think that was a good order. Um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that with that order. I might have uh, jumped more into programming at an earlier stage because I do think that <laughs> programming is something that I could have used the whole way through, and just been you know a lot more comfortable with the engineering side of it. Um, but no, physics really gives you a good way of asking questions. Uh, it gives you a good toolbox, I think, to be able to reason about new problems. Um, so like, you know, the physicists, uh, like the arch arch archetypal sort of problem that you, that you have in physics is a spherical cow. You always like reduce everything to a spherical cow. You know, you reduce it to a problem that you already know how to solve, um, no matter how ridiculous the reduction is. And so that's always been my approach, I think, to, um, to research since then. I think it's really formed the way that I um, that I ask questions. But um, yeah, so one one question that I think um, I asked, well, I, I, I asked this before I even really understood <laughs> what kind of a question it was. Um, it was, you know, during my postdoc, and I was talking with one of my uh, advisors about, you know, what was I interested in, like what kind of just question about the brain that I want to figure out. And um, and I just kind of formulated this without even really uh, thinking too much about it. But I, I, I was like, well, I wanna know how does what we know already impact what we can know or what we will know in the future? And just, you know, phrase like that, it sounds just incredibly naive. 
and very simplistic, but, um, but, you know, I've been working on, uh, you know, meta learning and meta reinforcement learning yeah. for years now. And uh, it wasn't until maybe a couple of years back that I, I thought back to that conversation. And I was like, oh, wow, that's actually exactly what I wound up working on, which is mm. um, how do the things that we have already experienced and know really shape the way that we approach new problems and, um, and the way that we learn in the future. So, I, I mean, I still haven't gotten an answer to that question necessarily, yeah, right. but um, yeah. That's, before you go on again, I'm just going to keep interrupting. So uh, I, that's really great that you remember, however, you know, maybe loose or vague the memory is that you remember you had that question. So um, Alana, I, you, you were at the CNBC in Pittsburgh, and I, I've, I've just been asked to do the alumni lecture, uh, the CNBC alumni lecture, which is a big mistake on their part. But one of the things, you know, that they want me to do is answer some of the questions that I ask on the podcast these vague things and what you know like one of these questions like what did you used to think you know that you now think is naive and stuff like that and i'm like i don't know my own answer to these questions that's why i ask them you know oh, so. geez, i think it's such an interesting like that is research right like we keep returning to these questions over and over again with new lenses right and i, I think that so many of the questions we end up answering are the ones that we asked long ago before we had the tools to answer them Right. I think that's actually really insightful. Jane. But but like Jane just said, those are the ones that seem to never truly get answered, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe that's is that what key? But, and do you also sometimes look back on your answers and realize like you answered the question? It wasn't what you thought the answer would be. And it didn't take the same shape you thought it would. Like you had something in mind. You answered the question and you realize you answered it before you knew you were, that was still the same question you were asking. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well, I feel like, you know, in the beginning, we ask questions that are really grandiose. and They're they're, they're the things that drive us, you know, and they have to be grandiose to be motivating. The more naive, the more grandiose, perhaps. Right? Yeah, yeah. But then once you finally figure out how do you go about answering this question and you make it um, concrete, you, you make it doable, then you're, you wind up answering a very small part of it. So I can answer something about neural network. How do neural networks meta learn in a specific set of environments, um, and, and what does that look like uh, in a very narrow sense? So yeah, I can I can answer that question, but um, but you know the larger question still drives me. I think in a lot of different ways. Well, so so the next thing that you need to tell us then is so you started off with the with the grandiose question uh, that that was a good question that and and now. Uh, you're grappling with many things, I presume. Um, wh what's one of those things? I, I and and how specific and how um, non naive is it now? Right. I I think I'm still quite uh, naive and and maybe grandiose in my question asking because um, maybe it's just because I don't know as much about this topic. But um, yeah, one thing that I I've been really interested in is thinking about how much of human intelligence is really cultural. It, it's due to the um, the social factors that that bind us. It's due to the fact that you know we have literature and ed education, and we raise our kids in a very social way um, with language and with um, through imitation. And you know, and kids are sort of primed to um, to to learn in that fashion. Um, if you if you raise a child in isolation, then they wind up um, having all sorts of develop developmental issues. Um, so, so yeah, and I, I think that that's a lot more people are starting to think about things like this as well. Um, and even in the realm of AI, which I think is really exciting. So, uh, I, I do think it is still quite a, a grandiose question because you have to not only answer, um, you know, how much of intelligence is cultural, but what is intelligence? You know, what, how do you define the human intelligence? And maybe this is why I started to think about this in the first place is a lot of what I do is I compare human intelligence or animal intelligence against um, artificial intelligence that, you know, you've, you've trained this model. Um, and a lot of, in a lot of ways, I feel like maybe the comparison is a bit unfair because if you're comparing a human, they kind of come in with all of these pre like, you know, pre-programmed in bits of knowledge that are cultural and are social and they're told things by the, um, the evaluator, by the, you know, the, whatever the researcher that's uh, conducting the experiment. And so um, and the, the machines don't have the, the same uh, benefit of that. Ida, how was the gig last night? Oh, it actually was great. It was by the beach, so it was wonderful. What instrument or instruments did you play? I played the melodica, the guitar, and I sang. 
Oh, 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 I didn't know that you were a singer. And um, yeah, I looked it. So, yeah. so what, uh, what gig was this? Oh, that was just. It's her other life. It's the it's her musical career, right? Oh wow, I had no idea. This is not going to be in the. Final do you want version. me to edit? Do you want me to edit it out? I can. I just thought it's fun. It's fun for people to I was hear. Just curious. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I make music on my free time, and sometimes I perform it, and yeah. So Ida has seen me frequently in the past month or so. She, so she was on the podcast. And then we recently did a, uh, a, a discussion panel for uh, deep learning and dopamine for the online um, dopamine conference. And in fact, uh, we did that like a month ago, but it's going to air in a couple of weeks through the podcast. So the time is a little reversed. So Ida, who are you? What do you do? And questions. Only if I knew. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a research, I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research in New York City. I work on reinforcement learning. I particularly work on, I build algorithms that learn to build models of the world, representations of the world, and then test those algorithms in brains and behavior uh, from fMRI to electrophysiology. And um, something that I'm very interested in and I've worked on for the past, I don't know, 15 years or something is uh, how the ways in which representations and memory is structured in the brain corresponds to how we would remember to, to do things in the future or we would predict or plan or imagine things. So the relationship between executive function, which is planning, which is multitasking and transfer learning, et cetera, to memory and representation learning. So that's something that has driven uh, my work uh, for a very long time. And I continue to work on that. And uh, now I get to sort of focus on it a little bit more computationally than the past, but I'm still obviously doing experiments both with behavior and still collaborating uh, on neuroscience data if I'm not collecting it myself. Um, yeah. Oh, another a direction of my research uh, that I really love is one where I study how um, the structure of groups of people talking to each other shapes their memory. So how the graph structure of a number of people talking to each other and the order in which the edges or the conversations on this graph happen uh, shapes whether they converge or diverge more. And uh, yeah, so that's a very exciting part of my work that usually I don't mention in talks uh, or unless there's a different audience for that. And, uh, and so I, I have a review coming out in uh, Philosophical Transactions of uh, the Royal Society called uh, Collective Minds, which is about this one, because this is something that has been on my mind since very early on as well. So I've, now I think I should mention it. <laughs> yeah. How, so... I just want to interrupt again, but um, go. Let's let's go through your questions. What 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 was the best? Uh, a good early question that you had, and what are you struggling to think about now? Okay, great, great. That was a great question uh, from you to ask. Um, I really enjoyed hearing what Alona and also Jane thought about um, had to say about that. I think so. My background is. I started with computer science and uh, I was actually coding when I was a teenager and like won some of com sort of competitions like that, which was a good starting point for me to feel the sense of algorithmic possibilities. And then I got very interested in philosophy since I was like, I don't know, 16 or something. And at some point I decided I'm, I'm going to do my master's in philosophy of science. While I was doing my master's in philosophy of science, the thing that I was very interested in was free will and like, like a million other people on earth. But uh, something that the, 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 the thing that came to my mind back then was that um, I was more interested in long-term agency and not free will in the metaphysical sense. And I thought that we waste a lot of time thinking about the metaphysics, but actually the more interesting question is how are we capable of long-term agency, especially in the face of uncertainty and so many things that change? What's long-term agency? Is that planning? Um, maybe, maybe. It is a little planning, but not exactly only planning. So consider the fact that you can order something, um, a flight, and then you can take that flight next year. That is an ability for long-term agency that you are not, your brain is not the only thing that's responsible for that kind of long-term agency. Or imagine that you promise me that next month you're going to send me the uh, audio file for this, let's say, for instance, You'll, you're going to send me the high quality uncut audio file of this recording. 
that um, is, it's not, it, it is planning, but it's also something else. It's uh, the fact that you are going to remember, this is a prospective memory thing. There is a social contract of the promise that you have made. There's a number of other components in it. And if you're a person that um, it manages to always sort of deliver on the, at, at the right time, then you become a responsible agent. Then I would consider you someone that within this particular domain has proper long-term agency, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, or consider the fact that you probably don't have catastrophic forgetting with regard to tying your shoes. Uh, you're Because of the fact that you're learning something new on a podcast, you're not going to forget that how to tie your shoes or how to cook food or how to, you know, set up your audio system. That tells me that you have also a, another kind of long-term agency that's consistent with a kind of continual, continual learning that doesn't erase what you've learned before when you learn new things. Mm -hmm. So that's another part of your uh, long-term agency. So as you can see in the things that I said, I had both things that are within a given algorithm, but I also had things that rely on social structures that somebody's embedded within. For instance, the plane that you're taking next year depends whether there is not another pandemic, that there is no war in the location you're going to, that you know there is not an environmental catastrophe, that that airport is entirely burnt down. You know, there are so many things happening, right? So it's uncertain. It's not exactly certain. And your long-term agency, to some extent, uh, depends on how our social structures are resilient towards the uncertainty of the world and how they are how sustainable they are. And so, when I was in my uh, sort of my first graduate degree, which was in philosophy of science, and I was thinking about how long-term agency, how can I think about long-term agency? I think that was the, the the initial trigger, and you will see that everything I do now is related to that. The question I had was how this long long term agency is mediated, but is because it's very special in humans. I was interested in what kind of structures and functions in human brains uh, mediates them on the one hand, and second, what kind of social interdependent structures are necessary to enable them. And as you can see, the first part of it relates to my work that I did in how the prefrontal cortex might enable this kind of multitasking, uh, perspective memory, analogical reasoning, all the, the, the kinds of nice things that my favorite region of the brain brought in area 10, which is anterior prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead does. Favorite region. And, then, <laughs> um, and also... Obviously, it turns out that um, uh, we have the, this is the largest cytoarchitectonic area of the human prefrontal cortex, and it's the region in which we have the biggest difference with other non-human primates. And then on the other hand, the work I've done on how graph structures of social um, interactions lead to our memories converging or diverging leads to the second part of that question, that our long-term agency to a large extent depends on our ability, uh, on our social structures um, uh, how our social structures basically augment or sustain our long-term agency. And uh, the first one and the second one, as you see, both of them are related to the notion of memory. Mm -hmm. And so I think that both executive function and a lot of our social structures have very deep connections to memory. And it's not just about brains, but it's also how our social structures are organized. And so as you can see, like that question that I started with during my master's degree in philosophy of science really drove everything that I did later on in science, mm -hmm. and I still do. And that's the reason I moved to computational neuroscience to a large extent. So it's interesting. So, you know, what Jane said, you know, becoming more interested in the social uh, aspects uh, as she learned more. That's kind of the way I feel, too, although I'm resistant to be dragged into the social uh, aspects of things. But you just because... I want to stay on the brain, damn it, you know, but of course there's, it's all connected, but, but you, but you, so the social aspect started you thinking about memory and structure and representations. And that's, that was the trigger that uh, set off the rest of your uh, career. The social aspect started when I was thinking about long-term agency and this mm -hmm. idea that what we really mean by free will is that we can do things uh, further into the, is that we have agency uh, and that when, you know, it, it, so it's funny because some people seem to think free will means acting randomly. If that was the case, then, you know, particle, random gas particles might have free will, but actually the ability to be able to have agency further down in time, that's the thing that requires a real kind of uh, agency. And I'm not, so that's why I moved away from the word uh, or from the com compound word free will, which has a lot of, uh, I think, com uh, confusion attached to it in incompatibilities and also in um, 
people who, who associated with being random or spontaneous as opposed to actually being able to deliver uh, a year from now. And so I focused more on that long-term agency. So that long-term agency was uh, mm -hmm. the philosophical idea that I was interested in coming from a background from a country where it was difficult to maintain it because social structures were opposing it, but seeing how people's mm, smart algorithms would overcome it and make somehow make it work, right? So all of those things are very much tied to that era when I was trying to figure it out, uh, figure it out um, philosophically. It was very tied to questions I had asked since I was a child, but it was very much what drove me to figure out, okay, the field I need to go to to answer all these questions is cognitive and computational neuroscience. So I can ask questions about social effects on agency about, or, or specifically, it's not just social interaction, so social structure. So I wanted graphs. Like I, I loved graphs since I was very young, just like anything that has to do with graphs and how representations in the brain would mediate it and how there's particular structures of the human brain that makes it possible in a way that it's not possible as far as we've seen in our evolutionary cousins uh, or the species that we know of. What's uh before we move on because I have a thousand questions. What what's something that's just out of your reach right now? Something that I would die to want to answer. No, I, I wouldn't want to die. Okay, that that I said that metaphorically. Um, <laughs> we get it. Yeah. Yeah. Something that I would really love to answer is so. There are, of course, different kinds of meta-learning. One thing I'm very interested in is how algorithms are meta-learned throughout uh, evolution. So not just certain parameters, but algorithms. And second, how the human prefrontal cortex makes it possible to to sort of um, to learn and drive it with many, many different algorithms, more possibilities of algorithms than are, again, our evolutionary cousins. So I think something that's very interesting is algorithms are limited the, uh, the further earlier in uh, evolutionary time we are. Uh, algorithms are uh, of a given organism are more limited. A given organism can have one or two algorithms very early on, and then it grows, and there is more that they can do. But uh, there are limits uh, for many species, obviously for humans too. But in a very meaningful way, we are capable of running so many different algorithms that uh, I agree with those people who say that human nature is not fixed, but it's defined socially and together with the algorithms that we agree upon uh, to a large extent. Obviously not 100%, but I think Franz de Waal made this point very compellingly, uh, comparing chimps, bonobos, and humans, suggesting that humans can overwrite their algorithms or determine their algorithms and behave like different kinds of um, uh, nature, so to speak, quote unquote. So uh, I think that, that uh, the idea, so those two things, like how, how different kind of architectures uh, capable of different algorithms evolve, but more importantly, how uh, the human prefrontal cortex enables many different algorithms within the same. And can we build algorithms like that, that are capable of flexibly just, uh, sorry, can we build architectures like that, that are capable of just flexibly um, hosting many different algorithms, for lack of a better word? Jane, the, the prefrontal cortex is just an LSTM that... Um that uh, enacts all of these different algorithms in its dynamics, right? Can't you just answer this for Ida and, and then satisfy her curiosity? You know, I was just thinking it's very interesting that um, the, the, our, our just out of reach questions seem to, to match uh, what uh, we have each done. So we should probably have a lot more conversations about these things. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that the prefrontal cortex is just an LSC and that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, even though uh, maybe maybe uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking that that's what we were saying in our paper, but um, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I was I was on Ida's uh, uh, the the wonderful learning salon um, to talk about these kinds of things uh, not too long ago as well, um, and I, I you know been thinking a little bit also about meta learning in evolution and how these you know um, how you can have these very long scale learning loops that emerge and that gave rise to our ability to um, have a brain that uh, can, can learn across our entire lifetimes. I mean, at some point, some kind of mechanism must have kicked in that allowed it to bootstrap itself and to be able to give rise to um, this kind of flexible learning that nonetheless persists. Um, and we continue to learn throughout, throughout the course of our lives. What about- yeah, but I also- Oh, go ahead, sorry. 
Well, I mean, I, I, I would say I, I also wouldn't say that I, I know the answers to these questions. And I also think that, uh, you know, I, I share Ida's um, uh, desire to, to know much more about these things. I think that it's, it's very much an untapped <laughs> area. Am I right to think of meta-learning as an algorithm itself? So that, just interrupt me, but, you know, so, so Ida's uh, question was about the sort of uh, explosion of algorithmic capacity and the meta meta algorithmic <laughs> learning. I don't know what you would call it, but um, is that something that uh, lands with you? And because I think of meta learning and multitask learning and all you know all the lifelong learning approaches as different algorithms to do um, lifelong learning. But I guess what Ida was asking, and you should clarify, I suppose, <clears throat> Ida, is whether um, there's an there's a way to um, exponentiate algorithms themselves and um, have them meta learn. I guess one thing that I, I wanted to highlight in that question that I think about a great deal, to be honest, is what are the principles, learning principles of architectures that can host many different algorithms? Mm -hmm. well, not just the driving force of a particular algorithm, not just meta-learning of a particular parameter in an algorithm, but the learning principles or meta-learning principles for architectures that can host many different algorithms without mixing them up, without catastrophic forgetting, without like, you know, the dog forgetting that it's a dog and thinking it's an eagle, you know, um, for lack of a better analogy. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what I had in mind. So it seems like humans are capable of a lot more. Maybe I'm optimistic about human capacities, but we can just imagine like, um, you, as a as a as a parent, as a partner, as a friend, as a child of somebody, as a as a as a colleague of somebody, as someone who's a customer to get coffee, as someone who's just crossing some um, border during COVID, we take so many different, very detailed roles very quickly and very flexibly. And in each of them, not only do we have different algorithms, it's almost we are different selves. And obviously, that's another thing that I hope, like, when I get older, I, I, I think, I hope I get old enough to at some point start, like, writing about the self and how <laughs> this different. You, you got to have a bunch of cats to do that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Cats who think they're eagles. Uh, but, uh, but then um, we, we do that a lot and very fast. Within the same day, within moments, we switch these roles. Like, you know, you switch the role from being a parent in the pandemic to just turn on the camera and you turn into a teacher or you're at an important board meeting or somebody's a judge or, you know. So um, this ability to this flexibly uh, adapt, adopt many different algorithms and switch between them without forgetting to breathe or like, you know, forgetting to uh, how to talk or forgetting your other languages if you speak multiple languages in different meetings. Uh, I think that ability is very interesting. And I, I mean, it's definitely not necessary for survival. So that doesn't seem to be the end goal. So if you just set the end goal of some systems to survive bacteria, some bacteria con colonies can survive millions of years. Like it's, it's unclear. It, it's excessive almost. There is something, you know, maybe it is towards like, we are like the increase of, we are, in, are, are kind of, um, you know, the new architecture is increasing entropy by allowing too many different <laughs> algorithms. Mm. And that's how we're participating in the expansion of the universe, but it's definitely not parsimonious. Mm. And that's something I think about a great deal. We are not parsimonious entities. Our evolution is not parsimonious. There's something, uh, and I want to understand what is that uh, learning principle or something else that we haven't maybe yet addressed, which is not just the simplest solution to uh, myself surviving and my offspring surviving, but there's maybe, maybe it is uh, connecting to the next question that you have already sent us in the list of questions. Um, I don't know what that is. I've, I've thrown them out basically. So you had this question about meaning and I, I, I think about this a great deal, whether at some point our due to our social structures and language and everything, we created some other kind of, collective organisms and they are now the ones who are trying to move forward and it's not individual fitness or the survival of individuals anymore in our species something else is going on so i'd love to talk about it more i don't want to and i'd love to hear what jane and also uh, alana have to say about this but um do we want to go down the meaning road right now or i was going to ask about humans specifically it, it 
I'm I'm open to go down any road you guys want to go down. So no, humans first. Why not? Well, okay, because Alana, you study language and vision, but I'm going to focus on the language aspect of it. And language is supposed to be the fancy human thing that we do. And uh, so you know. So AGI, right? Artificial general intelligence is supposed to, one way to look at it is human-like AI, and that that is a goal uh, of AI is to do human-like things. Um, And what Ida was just talking about is the um, part of what she was just talking about, thinking about the, these higher, um, you know, long-term agency and these higher cognitive functions that humans seem to excel at specifically relative to the rest of the uh, animal kingdom, et cetera. So, okay, so uh, more of X paradox, right? Uh, that's the idea that uh, the things that seem hard, uh, reasoning, chess, go, those are the easy things to do. Uh, however, the things that seem easy, walking, um, catching yourself when you fall, etc., those are things that are hard to do in AI, uh, but easy for all animals to do, right? But are these, okay, so my question is, is what, <laughs> my question is what's more impressive in humans if we're going to stick to humans here for a m- moment language or this long-term agency this higher level uh ability that ida was waxing poetic about yeah i'd like i'm not sure that the second could exist without the first do you think like i think language is the thing that helps us to create the agency that helps us to build the society that allows us to have the long-term agency that we uh enjoy today I'm not sure that means that one is more important than the other, but I, I just I think one is sort of dependent on the other. Agreed. But aren't we finding out with the language models that language isn't all that hard? Oh, geez. Is that what you think we're finding out? That's, that's what, that's that what, um, that. well, so there, I know that there, just like there are adversarial examples in vision and we haven't solved vision, et cetera, and they, they fail in different ways than humans fail. Uh, but the, just the ability to string together sentences that uh, you could interpret having some meaning, and I guess we can bring meaning back into this. It seems, and you could use, you know, like like you're saying, you compare vision and language, and there are a lot of similarities between them. So that w- might lead one to believe that there aren't that many differences uh, algorithmically, computationally, between how we process language and how we process vision. It's an open, you know, that's, that's why I'm asking you guys. Uh, well, so I guess my comment, that, so I've, in my work, found a lot of overlap in computer models of vision and computer models of language. But really, I mean, when I'm talking about it, I'm talking about like this single word concepts. So mm-hmm. like the CNN's representation for a ball is more similar to a, I don't know, a, a bat than a car or something like that. Um, and the same thing is true in, in computer models of language. So that's true. But then I think when you get beyond the, even like you were saying, like, you, they generate these sentences that you may be able to interpret. I, I believe that's true, but I also believe that part of that has to do with the creativity of the human mind. So we see a single sentence and we can think of an interpretation of it. But I think many of us have had the experience of interacting, well, many, some of us computer scientists have had the experience of interacting with a language agent like GPT-2 or whatever, and finding that it very quickly runs into a wall, right? And mm-hmm. it's actually not um, as coherent as you might have thought it was. Um, I think there's still a lot left to be done there. I don't think we're anywhere near having language solved uh, at the global scale, possibly at the at the local scale. We can generate the next word in a sentence given some context, and that next word might be reasonable. But trying to have a back and forth language generation like a dialogue system is still pretty far from optimal. So I was just going to say I, I agree with everything that Alana said, um, and I think that you know just to add that there's a difference between language and communication. I think that these um, generative language models are really good at uh, essentially babbling, and they're good at um, pretending, I think, to be to, to be communicating something. But can you really communicate if you have if you're not goal oriented? If you don't have any kind of reason to be saying these things, you're just saying it to sound like um, you know uh, whatever data set that you you train these models on. Um, yeah, because the loss so, function is completely wrong, right? Like the loss function is all mm-hmm. off, completely off base. It's like generate the masked yeah. word in this sentence. <laughs> That's not what people are doing, right? People are doing something much higher, much more goal oriented. Like, are they? Are, are they though? 
Aren't you right now? Aren't you trying I, to get I don't know. interesting I, and provocative things right now in the podcast? Isn't that like what you're doing? Yeah, but I but there's some random number generator in me also that is sort of producing what's coming out of my mouth. Um, so I mean, but because the I'm not very good at randomness, just to be clear. So <laughs> <laughs> I grant you that. But you know, one of the things like that you're interested in, Alana, is you you know figuring out how how to um, build language models that understand meaning. Right. And uh, okay, so we can get back to meaning. And I don't know that we understand in the way that we uh, believe language models should, quote unquote, understand. My particular understanding is fleeting and shallow and I barely scrape by. And I, I don't know that I have this. Um, I guess it would be a uh, uh, benchmark of whatever we're trying to build of understanding and meaning. And so maybe I just don't understand it. I think I think if we measured your brain activity as you experience the world, you we would find that you do understand it, and we would find that there are differences <laughs> between what your brain is doing and what what our computer models are doing. Yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> so I like to think of like so the brain when we do brain imaging, we're we're measuring the artifacts of the algorithm. We're measuring like the intermediate stages that the algor that the algorithm sort of outputs in order to do its next step. So it's like the ticker tape in a Turing machine. Right. Like we can see the states that are happening, but we don't have trouble seeing the actual operations. And I think if we could do that well in humans, we would have some sense of what people what people's algorithm are, it is. We might be able to trace back to the actual steps you were doing. So even if you're not really able to write down why you came to whatever conclusion you came to, why you decided to say the next sentence, if we were able to see sort of the, the mid steps in between you understanding what I had said and you deciding what you were going to say, we might be able to trace it ourselves, even if you can't recall it. Do you think, like, do you think that I, like, maybe I'm misunderstanding you? Is that what you were getting at? That you have this, you're not able to explain your own reason for doing something. Well, that that's uh, uh, sort of somewhat adjacent to what I was saying. However, I was going to ask uh, Ida anyway, so this is uh, related. Um, so Ida, you, you know, you've studied successor representations, and you know there are all these different algorithms for uh, learning the structure, uh, learning a representation, learning the structure of a cognitive map, and so on. Um, but is it possible that you know the that these algorithms aren't discrete? So, so this is what I'm um, getting at, Alana. By um, maybe, maybe it isn't discrete in the algorithm in my own brain. Maybe there are so many damn neurons, there are so many different algorithms that are mixed and matched. I could almost invent one uh, with my random number generator, invent an algorithm that learns a representation, and have some confidence that I could find a correlation of that in the brain. Uh, and I don't know, Ida, if you have thoughts on that. Like, if we really probe the brain, do you think that the algorithms are discrete or that it's really uh, very graded in terms of how the brain is actually computing these things? Sorry, I'm getting heavy. No, no. If, and I'm trying to, I think I'm failing to connect what you're saying to the current discussion, but let me try to try to understand it. There is what a neuron does, and there is what there is a state space that we infer based on the activity of populations of neurons and their connection to behavior. Usually, when we think about representations that are abstract or representations in general, even when they're discrete at least the ones that I study are within that state space. And even when it comes to place cells and place fields, the, that the successor representations, the, that the closest thing it can do to the cellular level, it's about place fields, which can be, which has a particular principle of it. And that even is a relational um, concept that's relating particular neural activity to behavior. And so some of the state, state spaces that we are talking about have discrete representations and some of them have more continuous representations. And some neurons seem to be firing, most neurons seem to be, seem to be firing in a kind of a continuous way, but some of them are, some things are sensitive to particular thresholds. So it's almost a little bit more close to not being continuous. But I don't work at the level of, cellular neuroscience to say anything about that. That's completely outside of any realm of expertise for me. Um, I, 
work at the computational, algorithmic, whatever level that uh, uh, Marians and anti-Marians would like to call that is not the lowest sort of implementation at the <laughs> complete cellular molecular level. But um, what I would say is that the state spaces that are inferred using math, using neural firing, using behavior could have con uh, 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 sort of um, continuous and non-continuous representations. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, you know, I guess I'm thinking in terms of, so, so the big um, success story with reinforcement learning in neuroscience and in AI is model-free temporal difference learning, right? And then um, we've advanced and there's model-based learning. And then there are, those two compete. And now we have, now we're getting, there are more and more and more different algorithms that we are building. So the successor representation is an in-between kind of thing. But maybe there are, how, how many different uh, reinforcement learning algorithms is our brain running, you know, is another way to ask. So... Let me answer that question by saying that TD learning, temporal difference learning, is also used to learn representations in the successor representation. Yeah. It would also be used if you don't know the model of the world and you're learning in the model base, you're learning the states by learning state state association, state action state association. So it's not that temporal difference learning, we saw it, it was just model free and we are throwing it away. No, it's a learning principle that can underlie different kinds of learning algorithms. Now, if you only believed that only model-free and model-based learning existed, then you would have to believe that the brain does both. But you can have other kinds of algorithms that look like that algorithm could address both of those kinds of behavior. Just to connect this to maybe this is what you meant by the last question that you asked. There are continuous versions of deep successor representations as well. So it's not it doesn't necessarily just need uh, things to be tabular. So this tabular versus kind of rich continuous environments, there are algorithms for both. I personally like to focus on the tabular first and then go towards deep and because I'm more interested in like basic algorithm, uh, algorithms that you can test on behavior and um, then go towards the deep ones. Mm -hmm. So there is an infinite number of algorithms that we can come up with, like virtually infinite number of algorithms that use very similar adjacent learning principles that might address a series of behavior, but not other things or a subset of behaviors or a subset of combination of neuroscience findings and behavior. So to think about giving a number and saying magic number eight. Come on, I'm probing you. You got to give a number. Yeah. <laughs> Seven minus plus two or things like that, or three or two or one or, you know, 42 or whatever uh, uh, your favorite sort of way to answer these kinds of questions is, or dual systems, everybody loves dual system. And then right. the third way, and then there's a lot of ways that one could do this. But what I'm trying to highlight is that although we are, those of us who are trained in the Middle Eastern slash European culture of thought uh, are very into dualisms, but it doesn't mean that that's necessarily the algorithms that we would find that there is two. And when there is a three, oh no, chaos. Uh, I think that we should think in terms of learning principles and just develop as many algorithms as needed until we have something that captures a lot. And uh, I think I'm, I'm on the side of all the algorithms that we have. Eventually, there will be a better algorithm that captures more things. And my goal is just to make sure that I refute my own algorithms or improve them during my own lifetime and somebody else will do something else. Hmm. So I don't think that, I personally don't think that you will find the exact model free or model base in the brain. I think that these are, these could fit in some situations, but not others. And we are just trying to improve the algorithms based on similar learning principles that all of them use just with small differences here or there. Mm -hmm. Some of these differences, however, make a huge difference, like model free versus SR slash model base, huge difference because it just doesn't care about states representations or interactions of states. SR and model base, they get much closer because they actually care about the re representation of states in absence of rewards. There is learning happening even without rewards, which means this is the first algorithms, first or at least minimum uh, RL algorithms that can learn something like latent learning. That said, if you go in the deep RL domain, 
There are some things that they call deep uh, RL that is model free, but it's not really model free because it has so many layers that it's actually learning some things about the states in the middle of those layers. So I think we should, that there is some care that should be taken into account when we call those model free because they're not really model free, especially when they have many layers that are learning different kind of representations to reach to that point. So I think there is nuance in the term, um, in the terms there is, Qualitative differences, at least in the tabular domain between model free uh, and SR and uh, model based classes of algorithms. But there are also similar learning principles underlying all of them, such as temporal difference learning. And I don't mean just temporal difference learning of rewards, as in model free, but temporal difference learnings of the successor states or tempor temporal difference learnings, uh, learning of transition structures. So, Jane, Ida says the answer is seven. Do you agree with that? I did not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, I, I'm wondering if you have, just from a meta learning perspective and continual learning perspective, if um, if you have thoughts on top of that. I guess, I mean, well, one thing I was thinking when you first asked this question, um, and you were saying, you know, how many R RL algorithms do, does our brain hold? Or at least I think that was the question. But sure. I, I guess I don't, I don't think that our, like reinforcement learning or even learning in general is... Um, is necessarily what our brains were built to do or is <sighs> like all that they do. Um, I, and I think learning itself is a continuous concept um, and that we, we should take a, a more broad approach than just to say, you know, oh, oh, you know algorithms or uh, we want to learn about, uh, we, we need to understand learning only in terms of the kinds of algorithms that can encompass learning. Um, I think that there is um, basically as a consequence of us being embodied in the universe and us needing to persist, there are various adaptations that um, different organisms take in response to the challenges um, to those to, to be able to persist essentially. And so I think learning is just one of those solutions um, that we have happened on that helps us with um, faster adaptation and that's why we're here and not um and not some other organisms so um i think it's all just a in pursuit of something else right and i think cd learning might be a nice way a, a, a simple way to encapsulate the way that um, organisms tend to do this uh where, where you know we have some sort of target we have some optimal point that we want to get to and then we can get to it via these um, th these tiny adjustments right towards that optimum. Um, but I think that that's, that's all just a, it, it's part of an, a, a larger, more like generic system of like dynamic system that we're just a part of. So I, I'm getting, I'm getting like a little bit philosophical and abstract, I guess, right here. Um, but you know, I just, I just been uh, inspiring me to Oh, wait, wait, I, I'm going to disagree with you there, though, because I feel like some of the things that you said might be contradicting each other. Um, it's, it's one thing to say the capacity for learning didn't, was not the ultimate purpose of life or how life adapted, but learning, especially expansion of brain architectures that can learn better is, uh, it did become one of the, let's say, auxiliary uh, sort of um, things that emerged. So it's not that we're saying that, no, nobody's saying learning is the ultimate goal of the brain, but it is one of the principal things that it does. It's a sub goal towards something else. Maybe it's, in the, it, I think it's no longer just individual survival. Hopefully, uh, uh, so hopefully it's uh, gonna, we can, we can retrace it towards ecological survival as opposed to ecological suicide. But um uh, well, I, I, I guess I just, I don't mean that, um, I mean, certainly the, the, like learning is, is what the brain does, but I guess I don't see it as being distinct categorically from other kinds of adaptation that maybe sure. you wouldn't consider like brain, like to, to be a brain, you know, like I, you can, you can Definitely. think maybe on one end of the spectrum, a riverbank is learning the water yeah. that flows over it and um, erosion is then going to be the result of that. Um, you know, plants to a certain extent to learn as well and they, they adapt in Okay. So I, I was saying I, I, one, one end of the spectrum. So you, 
like I, I would I, I wouldn't necessarily say that a riverbank is learning, but it is adapting in a sense. And I think that that's just um, one extreme of a continuum uh, at, at which the other end is the human brain. I think I can see your physicist um, intuitions uh, by the Burn. image, but but both philosophically and on uh, cognitive scientifically speaking. Uh, I would disagree that erosion or I, I wouldn't, I'm not as interested in a frame that considers erosion the same as let's say mushrooms that learn a particular path because the actual structure of changing yourself is different from the dynamics of things that happen to be in each other's way and influence one another, I think. And so it, it might depend on how, I think life is something that it makes a difference for me, things that are living versus not. And I guess this goes back to 19th century discussions of the importance of life. But I think that for me, things that learn are living things, unless they are AI. So then we can discuss whether <laughs> AI is a living thing or not, or like artificial, whether artificial learning is learning or, or not. How different is it from a riverbed? How different is AI from a riverbed? Because it's, you know, Silicon is extracted at the end of the day, it's extracted minerals. But um, I think that uh, the ways in which, I, I agree with you, where I do agree with you is that there is definitely a continuum between, let's say mushrooms and organisms that learn collectively and you know, learning that we think about in terms of learning in the brain. I mean, to be fair, TD learning seems to be what happens almost in, um, you know, the even, even the sort of very early uh, forms of life that basically move towards the gradient of move randomly. But as soon as they uh, perceive food, move towards uh, increasing gradient of um, food, that's already uh like, you know, I mean, it's not learning, but it's already using something that has to do with temporal difference comparisons, right? In decision making. <laughs> I feel like I need a definition of learning versus adaptation. Oh, geez. Yeah. Do, so do you guys know the constructal law in physics? The what? The constructal law. It's actually a physical law. I think it was like 15 years ago, but it's all about, uh, he uses riverbeds as an example of, it's all about life being a flow process and, um, you know, it goes back to heat wanting to flow well and riverbeds wanting to flow well and our cognition wanting to flow well. And it ties it all into basically um, whatever takes the fastest path to flowing well. People can look it up, I suppose. Sorry, I interrupted Alana. But but, but the uh, riverbed example reminded me of the constructal law uh, in physics. So I'll send you guys a link. I totally can see that many physicists would see it and many kind of, um, I would say, poets would see it the same way. Uh, I think that the side of me that's uh, there is a side of me that can that likes this idea of thinking about cognitive flow in the same way as a riverbed, etc. But at the same time, I do think when we are specifically talking about learning, and let's say TD learning, there are uh, living beings that don't have a brain that seem to show similar principles. But I wouldn't consider what happens in a riverbed to be able to 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 relate to it. So I do think there's something special in certain forms of learning that's specific to, or certain at least mechanisms of learning that's specific to living things. Ben, I'd like to hear what she, Alona was going to say. Me too. She wanted a, you wanted a definition of learning, right? Yeah. I mean, I guess I just feel like following a chemical gradient or, or even evolving to follow a chemical gradient. I just feel like it doesn't satisfy me as a kind of learning. Like it was... Oh. Evolving to move either, yeah, evolving to move randomly until you hit the chemical gradient, then following it. That evolution is not some kind of learning. And then the next phase of the evolution is, you know, they develop eyes, for instance, or they develop. Some... <laughs> That's the next stage. And then they the develop next stage. Like, you know, <laughs> well, no. I guess I think I don't, it's interesting to think about what's the, what's the place where you hit learning. I mean, does learning have to be something overt because like evolution is just a random walk in genetic space right I mean not not run not entirely random because some of them the ones that do do there many of them die out so at the end of the day it's not that random 
Uh, I guess the steps are random, although the success is not here, right? Yeah, it's a, so it's a random search. The yeah. mutations are random. Yeah. But the fitness oh, a... function determines. Well, okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> We did have a session at the Learning Salon with Sam Gershman, which regarded learning in the single cells. So there are some people who think learning can happen at the single cell level. And Elana, I don't know, like, um, how much, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know how further down in the sort of the, the cell, cellular level you have worked, but I haven't worked at the single cell level myself. So uh, anything that I would say on that would be based on what I've read and um, what I've heard. Uh, but uh, I think there is, and we did have this discussion too, whether this is learning or not. So it seems like some people, especially people who don't work at the cellular level, don't like to call this um, learning. But uh, can I ask you, do you think that um, a virus can learn? Yes. It's true. Really like it, right? but... <laughs> What's that? Do you think COVID has learned? You know, I just was listening to this po podcast. Um, well, actually, anyway, uh, they were talking about like, oh, the flu is like this cunning virus that's figured out. And somebody said, no, the, the flu is a clumsy virus. The flu has tried every damn thing. And the only <laughs> thing that's left is the one that works. It's not smart. <laughs> right. And so is it learning? It's just sort of fumbling towards the right answer. Isn't that how we learn also? We have to yeah, try. No, as as I, was thinking, I was thinking, like, what's yeah. the difference? Like, don't you try a million things? Literally right now, I'm out loud trying a million things. <laughs> And seeing which ones of them work, right? I mean, is it, is it that there's this bed. concept, there's this concept of a goal, right? That it's like goal driven, and that mm -hmm. if maybe maybe you consider the river, a riverbed or a single cell organism that doesn't necessarily have a goal, they just sort of have um, a consequence to. I don't equate riverbed mm -hmm. with single cell organism. I think there is a huge difference. Huge because difference. What, how, like it's well, how do you define that then? Why does a single cell organism have a goal, but a riverbed does not have a goal? What do you think life is? Do you think a riverbed is alive? I mean, Are rocks alive? Are rocks do, do alive? You, do you need to be alive to learn? <laughs> Unless you're talking about an ecosystem, it seems like you're not talking about an ecosystem. You're only talking about the rocks and the is water an flowing on the rocks. No, I, I am talking about a system. I'm talking about the entire, the, the water... No, I don't mean system. system. I don't mean a physical system. I mean an ecosystem in which there is life and there is a sustaining life. So that's different. There is a difference between just water and rocks and an ecosystem where there is other, you know, there is actual life forms. Well, I mean, but at, at our fundamental level, we are just a, um, a set of uh, differential equations, right? That we're um, not at that level. We can, we can program. At yeah, a fine yeah. enough level, we can program uh, any organism. I don't agree. Organism. Do you think we can program rocks? <laughs> no, I mean, but, uh, I'm talking about a dynamic system, right? Uh, a riverbed is a dynamic system. Okay, so I'm I'm asking you if you think there is a difference. I understand that the physical think... perspective could see anything as a dynamical systems, and I think on some level we can see all of them as dynamical systems. I'm asking if you think there is a difference between a living thing and a non-living thing. Yes, I think so. I don't think a rock is living. So do you I think, think there a, must single be... cell is, a single cell is living? I mean, I guess according to the bio, the, yeah, the biological definition of living, yes. But I mean, you know, it, it, what if you ask me, like if I consider that the earth is living or if I consider- The earth is an I mean, ecosystem. Like, it's not just- what, Do you consider ecosystems to be alive? Yes, yes. I, I'm not the only person either. They breathe, they, you know, they have like cycles, mm -hmm. they have uh, the certain things that sustain them. You and I, each of us is an ecosystem. In fact, we are, there are so many bacteria living in and around and on us <laughs> that are sustaining us entirely. And if, if that ecosystem of other species that are living within us gets messed up, we get messed up. Um, so the earth is in, in some way similar. Uh, it's an, any ecosystem uh, is a living thing, mm -hmm. but it's different from, just rock and water or two physical objects that are hitting each other. Well, but you can take um, two, uh, two, you can take any physical system and complexify it enough and you can zoom back out to a large enough level that it can look living. It can, no. it can just, it, you know, you can take any kind of complex system. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you love graphs. You're saying all the, complex systems are living? I think they, they, from a certain perspective, they can be, yeah. So internet is living? 
I think it definitely the internet is living. We so have, do you think the internet is the same as a single cell, the same notion of life? No, no, I think, I mean, so but by your definition, you consider the entire earth to be living, any ecosystem to be living, but they, that doesn't necessarily check all the boxes for biological life, which is they have to, you know, reproduce, right? Or they have to, um, like, I, I think that there are uh, different ways that you can consider things to be living. Ecosystems do reproduce and do sustain themselves. They do have seasons. They do change. They do, you know. I don't think they the Earth has reproduced kind of itself yet. And if it does, we should really, you know, find that other Earth because we're in trouble. <laughs> well, with the multiverse, I don't mean by I reproducing Earth, but the ecosystem is not the rock that is the planet with a heated core. That's the one that it seems like what we are destroying is actually the ecosystem on top of it which if you do reforestation, that's actually like replenishing it. So it does get replenished. If the, a seed drops or a particular number of seeds drop, another forest emerges. That's what I mean by ecosystem, not their heated rock or like cooled on the surface and heated at the core rock. That is not what I meant by reproduction. I'm not suggesting that planets reproduce as in they either duplicate or they have, uh, I don't know, they, they mate and create a new planet that's between the two. I certainly, <laughs> Love that story. I would love to see a, a, a see a book that's a science fiction about that. That's very cool, but that is definitely not what I was suggesting. In a similar way, though, I can see the internet as being self replenishing, right? I because like of the humans of that are connected to it. So, are you connect? Are you, if you mean the internet as in the system of computers plus the humans that connects them, that's a different. That that definitely is a different kind of a entity because there are humans attached to it. They are alive. So as soon as you connect that, you consider them, it's a different story. The so question anything is, that has something living within it is alive, but then you need to define what it means to be alive for the entities that are inside the thing that you're calling alive. Yeah, biological. Yeah, but I just, I mean, I feel like it's really uh, think This is not a confusing <laughs> thing at all, to it, be honest with you. It's very clear to me that a bedrock for in a river and a cell are not alive in the same way. And the notion of learning that we can apply to a cell and anything that's multiple cells is different from the notion of the way that a bedrock might change its shape because water flew over it for a million years. I, I, that's something that I think it's not, for me, it's not a continuous thing, it's clear. But I agree with you that if one wants to take the perspective of uh, uh, dynamical systems, that might be, uh, if, if you just want to look at it from that perspective and not from the perspective of what, what at least we mean so far by the notion of learning, there are continuities. If you want to see whether you can get inspired by the dynamical systems that you, evolve, that you developed to study the bedrock and then use those dynamical systems and equations to study learning, I can totally understand that. Different story, though, I think. Sorry, this took more long. This took longer than I thought. Yeah, this it was a little would. bit of a tangent. I, I, yeah, I regret a... uh, I regret my riverbed example. <laughs> I'm sorry about like <laughs> nitpicking on that example. Well, we have five minutes left. Should we bring it back down to earth? Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, I don't, you know, there are, we, I have a lot of different questions. Do we, do we want to end up talking about, uh, cognitive maps and are thinking about whether we have that right? Do we want to talk about the balance of, um, you know, unsupervised, self-supervised reinforcement learning and supervised learning in the brain? Or actually maybe we should talk about meaning and, and whether meaning is, uh, just the relation between concepts and, or whether we need grounding, like what, what meaning is, because that's what you're interested in figuring out with language models. If, I, if I'm correct. What is meaning, Alana? What is meaning? How do we get meaning? <laughs> we'll end on an easy one. Yeah, I don't know. That's a, I think there's a lot of, lots of uh, facets to that that are hard to untangle, but there's, there's certainly something that's emerging in our computer models of language that, that seems to be getting closer to meaning. But it is interesting to think about that, like our computer models have no concept of what the real world is. And so they say cat, but they don't really understand cat in a grounded way. And is that necessary to understand the world? I, I mean, I kind of feel like it is, um, especially for some kinds of common sense reasoning. I'm not sure we can get the whole way with the kind of text that we are using right now to train our models. Although I did hear one interesting um, thing sort of proposed by someone that 
if we had the right kind of textual data, we might have enough that if we had, it might be enough to, if we had the right kind of text data, not just any old random internet data. Uh, so if we had people in dialogue, that might be closer to what we need in order to get um, grounding, because it might be more about the world rather than just um, sort of adjacent to the world. Can you elaborate briefly what grounding entails? So grounding is understanding the connection between a, a representation that lives in our brain or a representation that lives on a computer and the real world, right? Like what, what is cat? A uh, cat is a thing in the real world. And what, how would I know if I saw a cat? How would I know if I heard a cat? What's the, what's the connection? At least that's what it is to me. I think grounding is probably one of the biggest things that these language models are missing in that they are not, um, I mean, the, the train on text generated by humans that are grounded, that are living in the world and are talking about things that are grounded. But the language models themselves are not grounded because they um, are sort of ingesting, uh, you know, just data from all different sources and they don't like care where it's coming from and, or how it's grounded. Um, and so I think maybe in, that's the distinction in my mind. I think maybe based on that distinction, I'll just say that even if there was a meaning at some point that these we could ascribe to this language models understanding, it's not the same meaning that we understand. Um, it's a different thing based on the objectives that they were provided uh, of what kind of task they were trying to solve. It's not the same meaning that we use language for. Uh, and so I think that's an important distinction too, because of the same things that Alana was saying that um, and also Jane was saying that we have these goals and that's why we're using these languages to communicate but uh, the reason that that model is using uh, language is because of some objective function that was defined for it. It's not the same goals. It's not the same motivation for communication. It's not the same thing to sort of sustain a life, et cetera. So um, I think that in this way that they are, even if at some point we manage to magically just like, you know, uh, uh, move a wand and then they're going to have meaning, it's not going to be the same meaning we have. I want to say one thing there that like, it's interesting to me that two models, let's just say computer models, can have very different goals and end up with representational spaces that are actually pretty similar. So I do agree that without similar goals, the representations will never be the same. But it's interesting to me that we actually don't have to have the same goals to have very similar representations. Right. I wasn't talking about representations, but understanding. So I was saying that the objectives that humans have and the objectives that the language models have are so different that even if they had some notion of understanding, it's not going to be the same understanding that we have, let's say of the word cat or dog, unless they start to interact with it in a human-like uh, way as well, which they are not. So I don't think that the distinction between objectives in a language model and the, way, the objectives of language in a human, I don't think that distinction is close enough that we would either have like, you know, a similar understanding or, that similar representations, unless it's on a very kind of broad notion of representation. But I wasn't talking about representations, but understanding or meaning. So I love where, the, where this conversation went. I have no idea how useful it is. But let's, Lynn, let's end on a very practical uh, notion, and then I promise we'll wrap up. Alana, most people go through uh, academia. They do the graduate work. They do a postdoc. They get faculty and, and or uh, go on to industry. You kind of did that backwards. Uh, by starting at um, Google and then going into academia. Uh, is that a recommended path? What do you think maybe benefited you and do you recommend and or you might have been missing and do you recommend that to other uh, prospective humans? Humans? <laughs> 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 Riverbeds. <laughs> um, I think every computer model should work at Google. I think um, so working at Google was fantastic and I was like like a hundred times the programmer I was when I left then compared to when I started. So I think that that benefited me a lot when I got to grad school because pumping out code was no problem at all. Mm -hmm. um, and a huge I learned a huge amount there. It, it kind of fast tracked your your faculty position as well. You, you went faster, I think, than most. Uh, well, so skipping the postdoc isn't completely unheard of. Maybe um, in the computational world. It is yeah, in the experimental the world. It's yeah. sort of, yeah, because of places like DeepMind and Microsoft, there's a strong pull for people to go to industry. And so there's, you can get, yeah, go straight to faculty from a PhD. Um, so that was good for Google. Also, I got a, a down payment for a house by working at Google. I also yeah. highly recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> Although I was living in Pittsburgh, as you know, and Pittsburgh is, uh, buying a house in Pittsburgh is pretty easy. Um, 
I mean, I think it was a, a the right decision for me. It also really helped me to solidify my goals and, and made me realize that it matters to me why I'm solving the problems I'm solving. I loved working at Google because the problems we solved were, were challenging and they were extremely technical. Uh, but the reason why we were solving them to me wasn't uh, the sort of thing that like got me up on Monday morning excited. You know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. uh, but if you're the kind of person who just loves solving technical problems for solving technical problems, then like it's a fantastic place. It, where I was would have been a fantastic place. But I wanted to solve a problem and be sort of passionate about that problem. I and Jane, you're both some, you know half in academia now, half in industry, I suppose. Do you have any uh, reflections on that or perspective to to close out? My perspective, well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I consider my job to be um, mostly like really similar to academic. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I w- would really even know what it would work, uh, would it would be like to work in a more sort of industrial uh, or like a commercial um, technical setting because I don't, uh, you know, I'm not working on production level code or any kind of like creating any kind of products or anything. I do mostly research and write papers and give talks and, um, and you know, do do fun things like this. So um, I guess one thing, I mean, I always get, uh, get a lot of questions about, um, you know, career path and things like that. And I, I guess if, you, if you're going to be in industry or doing industry research um, and you, but you might want to go back to academia, um, it is important to, I guess, continue to publish. And, um, you know, like if I were to, like, like, I don't think it would be a problem for me to um, try and look for faculty positions right now if I, if I wanted to leave, uh, you know, the industry research type of position. Um, but it might be, I don't know if it would be harder if, uh, if I kind of, you know, didn't do any research type of they like, didn't have any research output um for a few years and then going back and mm. uh yeah I, I i don't know that that a lot of people go that way i mean i think i think um yeah a lot of it sounded like you went to grad school and so that um sort of is a more standard way of i guess like becoming a, a pro- research professor i i know we're late do you have any additional comment to uh wrap up I just say for me, the, the, the objective was to be, to be able to do my research. And so uh, I, I did have academic offers and this offer from uh, Microsoft Research and other offers. And what I chose was the one that would enable me to do the research that I wanted to do. And so I just, for anyone who might want to try academic, uh, the sort of pursuing research outside academia, I would just say that there are many different paths working at, uh, at industry research does not equate coding at all. Uh, in fact, we have some um, uh, gra- computer science grad students who finish their PhD and they, they say that they wrote barely 100 lines of code because they use math to prove things. And in fact, there are people at Microsoft Research who spend most of their time proving that particular algorithms would converge as opposed to writing any code. And then they collaborate with someone who's like comfortable coding and they would provide maybe the deep learning part. And not every uh, industry research uh, requires to be related to product. This is something that Jane mentioned as well. Um, if you want to connect to products, you can, but that's like extra. Uh, it, it, you don't need to. It's not necessarily required. And uh, like Jane was saying, I'm also ex- completely focused on research and mentoring and um doing exactly what I would do in academia other than internships are shorter, the students are better paid, uh, so they're in a better mood maybe. But, um, uh, and and, uh, uh, the only thing that I guess I would miss a little bit is I actually enjoy teaching and like having the same student for five years and being responsible for them as opposed to having them for short stellar internships is a different kind of responsibility for the growth of another. And I do sense a kind of inclination in myself towards that. So I think at some point I might either go back to academia or take on more of these kind of co-advising roles and like, you know, some, some forms of like teaching that I do, but like maybe more, do more of that. Uh, but other than that, if someone doesn't like those parts, if that's not something that they like, uh, there, there's really room for doing very good and uh, high level research in industry. Get, go back to academia as soon as you get that down payment for the house. I think that's that's wise for a lot. I live in New York. I should, I should yeah. clarify. I was not. I was not in a research position at Google. I was like a software right. engineer. Right. So we did that's do why, a little machine learning, but it was it was totally for production. Yeah, that's why I was asking you uh, to begin with. 
guys, this has been a fun meandering down the river bed. Uh, th- I think this is a really good way to close out the uh, Neuromatch um, panels here. So thanks for being with me. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. It was fun. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it was fun. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stair-